this story. My name will be Charlie. Years ago, my first year of college, I lived in a dorm. But if only I knew what was going to happen. I earned a scholarship to college for baseball and all the players lived in one dorm. Being that I was a freshman, they roomed me with a senior so he could show me what right looks like. He was a pretty tough guy who no one would mess with, so I felt like I was in good hands. It was the winter and by that time of the school year, I was pretty set in my ways and comfortable. I was invited to a house party that one of the sororities were throwing, so I went with a few friends. When we got there, it was like any other party. People were outside and some were inside having fun. While inside, there was music playing along with people playing video games in one room and it looked like a board game going on in the other. That was upstairs. After a while, I went upstairs to see why anyone would be playing a board game at a party. When I got to the room, I noticed that it was the most quiet room in the house, which was odd to me. When I walked in the room, there were four girls and a guy sitting at a table. I asked what was going on, and they said they were using the Ouija board. I thought it sounded interesting, so I joined. But I never really believed in that type of stuff. While we were messing with the board, they said that there was a girl in the room. But I think that one of the other people that were playing moved it, so I left. That's when unexplainable stuff would happen to me in my dorm. I'd hear laughing in our hallways at odd times of the night, knocks on the window, and I started to have bad dreams. I told my roommate, but he told me it was stress from our upcoming midterms. That went on for about two weeks. Then one night, everything changed for both of us. I remember it being a Thursday night when this happened. I was sleeping in the middle of the night, and all I heard was, Charlie, Charlie. Charlie, wake up! I remember making noises and being half asleep, but I acknowledged him. Then he said something that woke me up immediately. Charlie, what the fuck is that in the corner? I looked in the corner of the room and I swear there was a silhouette of a girl. I was so afraid that I jumped off the top bunk and I told my roommate to get up and run, but he was so petrified, he was under his covers quivering. Then she spoke. Why do you seem so scared? All I wanted to do was play with you. I told him I'm out and we both ran out of our room. He was yelling that she's talking. After that, we were both so shaken that we never went back to that room. We called the police, but when they came, they never found any girl. I don't know if it was because of the house party, Ouija board game, or coincidence, but that was a moment that I'll never forget. To this day, I still hear odd noises throughout the night wherever I go. So I'm a nurse, and I was driving home from work one night. The roads were deserted, and it was freezing that night. I don't live far from work, maybe a couple of miles. I'm driving down a residential street around the corner from my house, and I see a man laying face down in the street. Once again, I'm a nurse, so my first thought was great. Gotta help this guy. I was coming off of a long shift, and falls happen all the time. As I slowed down the car, I suddenly realized what an idiot move it was. I'm a hundred pound woman and I don't carry a weapon. I thought I should do something to help this guy, so I called 911 as I drove past him and slowed to a stop at the end of the block. While I was stopped at the light, I explained to the dispatcher that there was a man in the road who might need assistance. All of a sudden, I hear a loud bang, bang from the driver's side window. I screamed and I looked over. A man was pounding on my window and jiggling the handle of my locked door. I looked in the rear view mirror and saw that there was no man laying in the street anymore. Still on the phone with 911, I screamed I'm so scared to the dispatcher and floored it through the red light. I quickly told him what had happened and even though I was right by my house, he told me to keep driving. After a few minutes, 
I had calmed down and he told me to loop back around. I pulled over down the road from my house and I stayed in the car. I didn't see the man anywhere, so I got off the phone with the dispatcher, who told me he was sending a police car to cruise the area. As I gather up my things, I do a final scan of the area. Then I see the man. He is walking with two other men. I hunched way down in my car until they were further down the road, then bolted into my house. I don't know if he had ill intent, but it freaks me the hell out that he wasn't alone. Just always, always lock your doors. This happened two years ago. My name is James and my girlfriend at the time was Susie. Susie and I got into an argument about a girl. She was just texting me about the edibles. The girl just wanted to know who had edibles and the prices on them. I remember I used the bathroom and after I came back to the living room, I saw Susie on my phone and she looked angry. She started asking questions about the girl. You know, regular questions, am I cheating on her? Is she pretty? The most disturbing one was, if she was right here right now, would I kiss her or my girlfriend? That was the PG version of what she really asked. I told her she texted me about edibles and besides that, the girl doesn't even like guys. But I don't think my girlfriend knew that. So we continued to argue for about 20 minutes. I started to say this is stupid and I remember looking at the clock and it was 11 p.m. Since she was staying over that night, I told her we should just stop fighting and try to get some sleep or watch a movie. We agreed and turned on a movie. We were watching Don't Be a Menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. As we were watching the movie, I noticed she was on her phone typing fast and just really involved in her phone. Every time I leaned in a little closer to see what was going on, she would always move her phone away and just give me a cold shoulder. We continued watching the movie until I heard somebody at my door. I said, I wonder who that could be at this time. Again, I looked at the clock and now it was one in the morning. My mom was in her room sleep, but after she heard the doorbell, she woke up asking who that was. I told her I didn't know, but I was going to find out. So as I started going to the door, I heard whispering from my girlfriend, like she was on the phone or something. I didn't really pay attention to it, so I finally got to the door and I looked through the peephole. I was met with some tall dude wearing mostly all black. I talked to him through the door and I asked him, what do you want? He replies with, I'm just here to drop off a package. Sorry, I'm late. And I was thinking, who delivers a package at one in the morning? So I told him to leave and he could come back some other time to deliver the package. He said no in a deep commanding voice. Just in that moment, my ex-girlfriend Susie comes walking towards me with a grin on her face. She says to me, so you're really not going to tell me who that girl was texting you? I explained that she wasn't anybody, and I didn't know her like that. And this is the wrong time to be asking me a question like that when there is somebody at the door I didn't know. Till this day, what she said still gives me the chills just thinking about it. She said, the guy at the door, he's here to get rid of you. At first, I gave out a nervous laugh and said, that's not funny. She said, yeah, it is. Well, at least for me, it is. As this was going on, the guy at the door kept messing with the door handle, trying to get in. So I was leaning up against the door, preventing him to come in. As I looked behind me, Susie was gone. A few seconds later, she comes back with a knife and said, either he's going to get you or I will. I started flipping out and thinking, what am I going to do? I can't die right here. Just in that moment, I heard a commanding voice saying, back away from the door or we'll shoot. I thought to myself, what the fuck? So I swung open the door and there was the police. One of the police officers told Susie to drop the knife because when I took my eyes off of her and I opened the door, she was right behind me, like literally right behind me. But the officer saying that must have scared her and she dropped the knife immediately. Apparently, while all this was going on, my mom called the cops and explained the situation the best she could. She pretended to be asleep so she wouldn't cause attention to herself and could get help as fast as she could. The police arrested both of them 
and took them to the station. Apparently the guy that was there was her cousin. And the whole time the movie was playing, she was texting him, telling him to come over and quote unquote, deal with me. I'm just happy that I'm still here today. My mom saved my life. I don't even want to imagine what they would have done with me. My name is Chris, and this happened to me in the late 1970s. I grew up in a poor neighborhood in Calgary, Alberta. And like most young kids, I had a number of friends from school and neighborhood. I was 13 at the time. And this was right at the very beginning of the personal home computer revolution. You would hear about personal computers on the news all the time. However, no one actually owned a home computer. And it was almost like a story of science fiction to actually see one. One day, my friends started talking about this university professor who moved into one of our duplexes near our school. He was supposed to be a really cool guy who had all kinds of gadgets in his apartments and he actually owned a personal computer. One afternoon, when walking home from school, I was crossing through a park near the professor's house. From the second floor balcony of the duplex, I saw some of my friends and they waved to me to come over, so I did. The teacher lived on the second floor of a two-story duplex and looked the part of a teacher with shaggy hair, beard, and glasses. At the time, I was too young and naive to see the warning signs about this guy. He lived alone in a three bedroom duplex apartment. He said he had a girlfriend, but we never actually saw any woman ever at the apartment when me and my friends were there. He had a lot of weird looking camera equipment and developed his own film. Most importantly, he was a computer science teacher when the field was pretty brand new and he had built a home computer from scratch. My friends and I thought he was the coolest guy we ever met. He had all kinds of games on his computer, and he allowed any of the young guys in the neighborhood to pop by and play on his computer. He also had all kinds of weird gadgets and experiments. He had one of those Jacob Ladder lightning art gadgets you'd see in those old horror movies. He always seemed to have some new gadget he was making. It wasn't long before we were going over this teacher's house to play on their computers or see his weird gadgets all the time. Sometimes, he get very physical and grab one of us from behind and bear hug us when he was greeting us. Or he stand uncomfortably close to us. After a few months, we were getting suspicious about this guy. and He didn't seem to have any family or friends. Sometimes, when there were a lot of kids at his apartment and he was distracted, we would snoop around and look in his cabinets and things like that. We find weird items like a pair of brass knuckles, handcuffs, and some beads that looked like they were supposed to be white, but they had dried up brown stuff on them. And the door to his bedroom was always locked. One day, when there was a lot of kids there, he put on some music. He always puts on music, but this time it wasn't top 40 music like he usually would put on. It was like folk music of some kind. My buddy and I were already suspicious at this point, and while everyone was having fun on the computer or hanging with the teacher, we listened to the lyrics of the music. It was hard to make out the lyrics over all the raised voices in the room, but it became very clear that the lyrics was about homosexuality. My buddy and I freaked out, as it hit us at the same time that this guy might like kids in a way that wasn't right. We quickly made an excuse to leave and went home and told our parents of our suspicions. My father freaked out and told us never to go over that guy's place again. We also put the word out on the street and pretty quickly everyone became weary of this guy. However, one of my friends from our block, Danny, he thought we were all wrong and he kept going to see this teacher. One day, Danny stopped coming to school and the rumor was that something bad happened to him by that guy with the computers. Danny moved away and not long after, so did the teacher. I can't tell you how lucky me and my buddies felt to have stopped going to that guy's house before something happened to us. Years later, when I was in my early 20s, I took a course at the university on computer programming. One night, my buddy and I were in a computer lab and we were testing out a new program I wrote. 
when who walks into the lab? That old guy. This time, both my buddy and I stood up and yelled at that guy to get away from us. He quickly left, and other people in the lab asked what was going on. We told them what happened years ago. I don't know if someone reported him, but we never saw him at the university again after that. This story happened to me on my first day of high school. I remember walking down my street in the morning toward the bus stop. There were a few other kids that stood next to me talking. There was also a man who definitely didn't belong at a high school bus stop. He was tall, had a shaved head, a mustache, and a white tank top on. I thought he looked weird and out of place, but I really didn't give it a second thought. My first day of high school actually went fine. It was on the way home where it all went wrong. I got on the school bus, and as I was walking to find my seat, I saw the same man from this morning set on the back of the bus. This time, he was staring right at me. I didn't know then, and I still don't know now, how this guy even got on the bus in the first place. The house I lived in was one of the last stops, so by the time I stopped arrived, most of the kids have gotten off the bus, and the bus was empty. I could just feel that guy staring at me the whole bus ride home, though I didn't dare to look behind me and check. When my stop finally arrived, I got off and I started walking, and of course that creepy man got off and started following me. I started walking faster, and as I did, the man got faster, and that continued right down my street. The faster I walked, the faster he would. It got to the point where I needed to start running. Thankfully, my house was close by. I ran by my house and slammed the door shut, and I looked through the kitchen window to see if the man was still chasing me. He was walking past my house like nothing ever happened while staring at me. Later that night, I was upstairs in my bedroom when someone knocked at the door, the downstairs door. The next thing I heard was my mom calling me downstairs. When I get there, my mom is looking confused and checking around outside. I say to her, yeah, mom? She said, that's weird. There was a man just here asking to speak to you. I asked what he looked like, and she described the same man who chased me home earlier that day. I told my mom about what happened and how I was pretty sure it was the same guy who knocked at the door. My mother told the police and our school, and actually, this wasn't the first time they have heard reports of this. From what I know, he was never caught. Who knows what he could be doing right now? Just be careful. This happened to me about seven years ago. I worked at KFC through high school and college. I went to college really close to where I grew up, so staying at the same work location was very easy for me. One day I went to work at 4.30 and had to work to drive through half of my shift due to someone calling off. It seemed like a regular day until we were getting ready to close. At around 10.50 p.m., this guy walked in and stood by the front register. He looked weird as if he just came from a costume party. I let him know that when he's ready to order, just tell me, as I'm cleaning due to us closing in 10 minutes. He told me that he wasn't ordering and wanted to know what time he closed. I told him 11 p.m. and he left. I'd noticed that he got inside a van that has been sitting in the parking lot for hours. I thought it was weird but continued to clean up. There were a few of us still on shift. Again, everything seemed regular that night. I grabbed the trash and went outside toward the dumpster. As I approached the dumpster, I noticed someone trying to hide in the shadows behind the dumpster. I stopped immediately, and I tried to squint in order to get a better look. Then whoever that was behind the dumpster moved back so I wouldn't be able to see their shoes anymore. But they didn't know I already saw them. I turned around immediately and went back inside. 
I told my manager he went to the door with one of my co-workers to get a better look. They couldn't see anyone, so they went outside to check it out and left me inside by myself. I felt safe while they were outside. I went to the cash register at the drive through to cash out for the night. Then on my left, I swear I saw the man from earlier in the window. He had a blank look on his face, then he started hitting the window with a dead raccoon trying to get in while yelling my name. I ran to the front door as my manager and co-worker were walking back in. I frantically told them what happened, and my manager ran back outside to the window while my co-worker stayed with me and called the police. The guy left before my manager was able to get him. The cameras outside got the license plate, but it didn't match the description of the van, and the plates were registered to a woman. This guy was never found, and I am forever worried that he will come back for me. Growing up, I lived in the middle of the woods. No neighbors for about a mile on each side. And we owned 60 acres of forest and a swamp after that. So I basically lived in the middle of nowhere. One summer when I was about 14, I was out in the middle of the woods playing with my dog. When I kept feeling something hit my elbow. I'd go to throw Max's ball and the bump would make me throw it straight up in the air. Assuming it was just me bumping it on the trees or something, I just ignored it. After the fourth or fifth time of it happening, I thought, well, this sucks. I'll just go home. Walking back, I felt uneasy, but I knew it was just me freaking myself out because we were alone. About an hour later, Max and I are at home on the couch when the garage door opens and he starts barking. I hop up to, you know, go let my mom and dad in, even though they were home really early. I peered through the peephole and saw the door was still shut and no one was in the garage. Quieting Max down, I opened the door slowly, and I called out for my dad. Nothing. No response at all. So I got out to check the door, and it's still locked. Okay, sure. Weird, but oh well. Max heard it too, so at least I know I'm not going crazy. About 20 minutes later, I hear the door open again. And this time, Max starts growling like crazy. I quiet him down again and just assume it's the wind or something making noise, even though by this point, my heart is racing. I hear footsteps come up the stairs and think, oh, geez, dad really is home this time. And I hop up and run to the door. It starts to jiggle, so I run faster to let him in. I peek through the hole, and even though my hand is loosely around the jiggling handle, there's no one on the other side of the door. Terrified, I go hide on the couch with all the lights on, but Max is still growling. About an hour after that, I start to feel a little better even though I'm still terrified, and then I hear the door handle jiggle again. This time, it was Max jiggling it. He needed to go outside, and the only way outside is through the garage. Fantastic. I literally sprint with him to the kennel. And as I'm standing in there, I decide to ask this thing questions to make myself feel better because I knew it wouldn't answer me. Thinking about what to ask, my eyes are drawn to the huge, heavy oak door on the kennel. It was always open because it was too heavy for me to move easily. So I said out loud, Okay, ghost, if you're really here, shut this heavy door. Then nothing. A minute goes by, nothing. Max is still sniffing around. I turn around and yell at him to hurry up and then from behind me I hear click. I whipped around and saw the giant door had swung shut and latched. Okay, clearly it was just the wind. It wasn't really windy but it was the wind, for sure, it had to be. So I proceed. Okay ghost, that was the wind. If you're really real, you'll open the massive door back up. Then nothing. 
I relax a bit and then squat down with my head on my knees, reminiscing about how lame I just was being scared when I hear click, clack. The door was now wide open. Max was done, so we booked it back into the house, locking every door in the house. For the next four hours, I would hear the footsteps on the stairs and the door handle jiggling every few minutes until finally, around 11 p.m., my dad walks and yells at me for wasting electricity. I never told him or my mom about it until about four months later when my dad came in from hunting after dark. He looked shaken and I asked him what was wrong. He said he aimed at two deer but missed both completely because it felt as if something was hitting his elbow and making him shoot way above the deer. That's when I told him everything. My name is Stan. I'm 17 years old and this story happened about four years ago. The school I went to was in a very rural area in my village. My friend Peter went to the same school, but I lived further away. His mom would always drop him off near my house and we would always walk to school together. On our way to school, we would always pass some farms and one of them had this really old creepy house that was abandoned for years. One day me and Peter said we should check it out and see what's in there basically. We couldn't go after school because, like I said, Peter lived further away and his mom needed to get him home. This was also during the winter, so it got dark sooner. So myself and Peter, we came up with the plan that Peter would have a sleepover around my house. And when my parents were asleep, we would sneak out and explore the abandoned farmhouse. It was Friday and the past few days had been snowing. After school, Peter came to my house we spent the evening playing video games and looking up creepy videos on the internet, anxiously waiting to sneak out. 1 a.m. rolled around and we put our coats on and snuck out my bedroom window, which is ground level. We had one flashlight between the both of us, which Peter managed to sneak out of his dad's garage. We walked through the farm fields and made it to the house. Naturally, the first thing we did was try to open the front door, but it was locked. We looked around at a few of the windows and one of them was smashed open. So we used this as our entrance. Surprisingly, the place seemed rather untouched for how long it had been rumored to be abandoned. It was just covered in dust and had a really strong smell. Not bad necessarily, but it did smell odd. I shone my flashlight to the top of the stairs. I couldn't see anything, but it seemed really eerie up there. And then I heard wood creaking. It kind of sounded like slow footsteps, but I wasn't certain. Peter then said, we should check upstairs. I told him I'm not going up there. There's probably some maniac up there waiting to kill us. The next thing that happened was the phone rang. One of those really old phones made myself and Peter jump out of our skin. At that time, I didn't think about it, but I thought it was weird of how someone was calling this house and it was abandoned. I picked it up and I said in a nervous voice, uh, hello? For a second there, there wasn't any response. And then a man spoke on the other end saying, I'm not a maniac. Why don't you come upstairs and see for yourself? At that point, loud, heavy footsteps ran across the upstairs room and toward the top of the stairs. Peter and I ran out the farmhouse as fast as we could. We ran out down to the farm. I glanced back to see if there was someone chasing us, but there wasn't. So I told Peter to slow down so we could catch our breath for a second. After taking a better look at the house, one of the upstairs lights was on and there was a dark figure standing at the window watching us. I didn't know what to think, and honestly I was terrified. The light then turned out, and the both of us made our way back to my house. We managed to sneak back inside without making my parents wake up. Peter didn't say much. I think he was too creeped out as to what just happened. And to be honest, I didn't feel like talking either. I was actually quite paranoid that, I don't know, 
that guy was gonna follow us to my house. Thankfully, at least to what I know of, we weren't followed. From that night on, every time me and Peter walk to school, we look at that creepy farmhouse. We can't help but feel someone's looking back at us. had just moved into a tiny town that was literally in the middle of nowhere and had less than 100 people in the total population. I was about seven at the time and I had overheard my parents talking about a dog that kept barking all night that kept them up. I wanted to help them so I went out looking for neighbors with dogs just to ask them if they could maybe keep their dogs from barking all night. So this particular town had a bad track record of houses catching on fire. So there are a lot of old half burned houses just sitting there. This particular incident happened with one of these ruined houses. As I'm walking, I hear someone call out to me and I turn to see a very beautifully kept lawn in front of a nice white two story house. There's a nice old couple sitting in lawn chairs out in front and the woman is calling me over. I walk over to the fence. The woman asks me what I'm doing walking around here by myself. I tell them about the dog and ask if they know about it. The woman says that it's her dog and she'll try to keep the dog down and then offers me a full size Snickers and I took it. Feeling like I accomplished my goal, I went home. At that time, I really wanted to eat the Snickers, but it had melted on my walk back home so I put it in the freezer to chill. Then my friend comes over and we head over to her house and I forgot about the candy. Wondering how the ruined houses fit into this? Well, when I return home from my friend's house, I tell my mom about the nice couple and they would keep their dog quiet. I tell her where the house was and she gets really confused. What do you mean? There isn't a house there. I would have shown the candy bar as evidence, but I had totally forgot about it. After some back and forth, we agree to go on a walk tomorrow in the daytime so I can show her which house I mean. Next day, we walked down to where the house was and there was no house. The well-kept lawn was just overgrown weeds and the house was just nothing but a pile of rubble. Only the fence still remained. I ran home to show her the candy that I had just remembered about and that was gone too. I still get chills when I pass by that vacant lot to this day and right now, I'm 20 years old. It was Christmas and I was a freshman in high school. My family has been split up for some time. So normally, we trade off Christmas Day and Christmas Eve each year. And this year, I had come home early from my grandparents' Christmas party while everyone else was at my aunt and uncle's celebrating another party. When I was dropped off, my cousins offered to stay with me for a few hours, but I declined. I thought I could watch some of my new DVDs and get some alone time in this house, which is a rarity. I had noticed an unfamiliar car parked on the street, but didn't think anything of it, considering it was Christmas Eve. Probably a neighbor's relative or something. I hadn't been home for more than 15 minutes when there was a knock at the door. I unlocked the door and opened it only a crack to see a man standing there. Dark hair, glasses, slightly overweight and dressed casually. He didn't look like much of a threat, but my stomach dropped. He asked, I was wondering about the car outside. Is it for sale? I told him I don't think so. Is there someone here I can talk to about it? I said, quite stupidly, no, you can come back another time. And I shut the door and turned the lock as fast as I could. He reached for the door handle immediately and started pounding on the door. I heard a string of profanities and a pounding stopped. Terrified, I was crawling on the floor to the phone, hoping he wouldn't be able to see me through one of the windows. Then I heard the noises. Our house has an open garage door, and it led through to the laundry room, where the door lock was broken and no one had bothered to fix it. 
Just then I heard a man yell and I saw the man through the window run to his car and drive off. My uncle had gotten him, just in time, and he scared him away. Who knows what would have happened if he hadn't made it home in time. Sadly, we didn't get the plate number and nothing ever came of it, but I'll never be home alone again on the holidays. We used to have this neighbor. His name was George. He was about 50 years old at the time. He lived alone and I swear all he used to do was just stare out his window, giving us dirty looks. Whenever kids would knock on his door asking for their ball back, he would always curse at them and make a big fuss about it. Sometimes he wouldn't even give the ball back until a week later when he would just puncture the ball and it would be flattened and he'll just throw him over the fence. He was a moody old guy. But every second weekend of the month, he would go fishing for two days. I was 15 at the time of this story. And one day, myself and my friend, we came up with an idea to sneak into George's house. Because as dumb teenagers, we thought it would be hilarious. So that following weekend, George left for his weekend fishing trip. And that same night, me and my friend, who was sleeping at my house at the time, we snuck out late and went to check George's creepy house. I always knew he left a spare key under his plant pot, so getting inside was easy. I know this is breaking and entering, but what we discovered in the house made me thankful that my friend and I came up with this dumb idea. We looked around George's house. Most of the rooms were pretty normal as far as normal goes. My friend went off and looked around the other rooms while I went into his office. There was a computer there. I moved the mouse around and clicked on the login. Funny enough, he didn't even have a password. I looked around his PC desktop at what applications he had. Pretty basic stuff, but I noticed a file called Favorite Photos. I clicked on it and saw hundreds and hundreds of inappropriate pictures of children in our neighborhood. I was thinking to myself, what the hell is this? Just as I was looking at this sick stuff, I could hear my friend loudly whispering to me from another room saying I need to look at something right now. I left the computer desk and went to have a look. My friend found a duffel bag with duct tape, sleeping pills, candy, a long piece of rope, crowbar, and a loaded gun. We were both in complete shock. I also told him and I showed him what I found on his computer. We both were scared as hell, and it wasn't funny anymore. We put everything back the way we found it and snuck out back to my house. Me and my friend didn't know who to call, so we didn't really want to call the police because we would have gotten in trouble for breaking in. We chose not to say anything to anyone until this story. It was prom night in the place where the prom was being held in a big lodge in the middle of the countryside. The prom was going pretty well. I snuck outside to have a cigarette. I stood outside around the back of the building. I lit my cigarette and enjoyed the view of the countryside. As I was looking around, I noticed something in the distance out in the field. It was a figure walking toward the lodge. I kept my eye on the figure as I was smoking. At some point, the figure must have noticed me because it stopped. Then it started running toward me full speed. Getting closer and closer, I could see it was a man. A crazy dude sprinting really fast with long gray hair, carrying what looked like a hatchet. The guy seemed to be smiling, but angry at the same time. I dropped my cigarette and I turned around to go back inside but the door was shut behind me as it was a fire exit and only opened one way. I started banging on the door screaming for someone to let me in. It was too late to run around the front of the lodge. The insane man was too close so running wasn't an option. 
I kept banging on the doors, but I was thinking I wasn't going to be heard as the music was playing loudly. And I was thinking I was about to die. Just before the man got close, the fire escape door opened with my friend asking what's going on. I quickly pushed her back and I scrambled inside. I also slammed the door shut right behind me. As soon as the door closed, I pressed my ear against it and I tried to listen to see if the man was still there. All I heard was heavy breathing. Then I heard footsteps walking away on the stones. I told my friend about what I just saw, but she didn't believe me. She said it must have been one of the guys playing the prank on me, but I know what I saw. I couldn't enjoy the rest of the prom after this knowing there was a crazy man out there. Luckily, nothing happened the rest of the night, but I always worried about whoever that man was. He saw my face. And if he saw me again, what will happen? When I was 17, I didn't have a driver's license. Most of the time I walk or hitchhike. There was this one night. There weren't that many cars on the road and it was very cold. And this man pulled over. When the guy pulled over, I, I took a good look at the guy and figured I could take him if he tried anything. He was on the slender side and had a strange frailness about him, even though he looked healthy enough. I got into the car after we agreed on the destination. We exchanged names and I warmed my fingers up in front of the heating vent. He spoke quietly, asking a few questions along the lines of, was I local and how did I like living there? He said he only been here for a few months, but found it beautiful and hoped he could find happiness there. That comment struck me as a little odd, but I brushed it off. It began to snow and the road quickly got slippery. So he slowed and he kept his eyes straight out the windshield, driving silently. I was okay with that, as small talk was never my forte. About 10 minutes later, I noticed the car near the intersection we were approaching seemed to be sliding, so I said, watch out. He immediately hit the gas, shooting through the intersection and burst out with, don't ever scream at me. Needless to say, I was taken aback. I said, look, this is close enough. Just pull over here and I can get there. He didn't seem to hear me. So I said, Richard, did you hear me? I said, you can pull over here and let me out. But no response. He just stared straight ahead, driving faster now than he did when it started snowing. To say I was scared doesn't seem to cover the death of the fear that began to arise in me. I didn't know if I should stay quiet or speak, but I was damn sure not going to yell after his outburst. After about a mile, he began to mumble under his breath. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying, but I assumed he was speaking to me. So I said, what did you say? I couldn't hear you. He began to speak quietly and rapidly saying things like, you're always yelling at me. I've told you time and time again, do not yell at me. I don't appreciate it. No, you don't listen. You don't listen. And I was just sitting there looking at him. I was at a complete loss. I didn't know what to say in response or if I should say anything at all. I contemplated just jumping out of the car, but nixed that idea when I realized the door lock was missing. There was just a silver lined hole where it should have been. I started to cry and debate with myself about causing an accident by grabbing the wheel and hoping for the best. When he suddenly looked at me for the first time since I had gotten in the car, he blinked several times rapidly, then slowed the car, pulling into a gas station. I waited to see if he unlocked the doors, not wanting to say anything to set him off again. After a minute or two, he quietly said, I think I better let you out of here. And he hit the button to the door locks and he opened the door. I wasn't about to hesitate, so I jumped out of the car as if I were on fire. I was about to turn and walk into the gas station when he called my name. He looked so damn sad and 
I hesitated. He apologized, said he was sorry if he had frightened me, that he never would have harmed me. And he asked if I'd be able to get home okay. I said I would and closed the door. He began to pull out of the gas station, but stopped suddenly. He just sat there for a couple of moments, his head down. I froze, wondering what the hell was up and was about to run into the gas station, but he opened his window and yelled at me, waving something in his hand, my hat. I left it on his seat. I slowly approached the side of his car and he handed it to me, apologizing again. I didn't know what else to say, so I just said, thanks. I watched as he drove off, making sure he was out of sight before moving on so he wouldn't know which direction I was heading. As I walked, I went to put my hat back on, and a piece of paper fell out of it. Folded into a paper was a hundred dollar bill. The paper said, I'm sorry, please take a cab and don't hitchhike anymore tonight. I didn't. In fact, it was the last time I ever hitchhiked in my life. Would never, ever do that again. One day, I got a call from a few friends of mine about going to the mall. It was a stressful week at work, so I thought some retail therapy would definitely help. We ended up shopping for a few hours, so we decided that hitting the food court would be the spot. I gave the girls my order, and I told them I would come back and find them as I needed them after I used the restroom. The restrooms are at the end of the large and wide corridor. They were your typical mall type with lots of stalls. Anyway, so I sat down to use the bathroom and I could see from the gap on the floor between the wall of the stall and the floor, lots of movement from someone's shadow. I wasn't sure if they were getting changed or not, so I didn't pay attention at first, but it felt like the shadow was coming from above at some points. You know, as if the light above was being obstructed by something. After maybe the third time, I decided to look up and I could see a phone and parts of a guy's arm leaning over. Someone was taking photos of me. I instantly shouted out, what are you doing, you pervert? And in a moment of sheer shock and disbelief, this all very quickly turned into fear as I got up and leaped out of the stall and was greeted by an empty bathroom. Not one person was in sight. And from the quick glance of the mirrors opposite, there was only one stall shut and it was the one next to me. I ran for the restroom exit, but it was locked. Luckily, it had a twist lock and I could turn it as I did. I heard the stall open from behind me. I got out immediately and turned as I exited and noticed a sign on the door saying, closed for maintenance. This sign was not here when I went in. I screamed some more, shouting to get anyone's attention as I ran down the corridor toward the food hall and had obviously caught the attention of a few people. A group of three guys stopped me and clearly could see the panic in my eyes. They asked me questions and I explained. Two guys ran toward the ladies' restroom and one to find security. Security arrived within seconds. After a while, a rather large crowd had gathered due to the commotion and although I was in the comfort of my friends, security and now the police, I never felt so alone. Security and police, nor two guys found anyone. There was a few staff only, and fire exit doors opened down the corridor, so plenty of escape routes for whoever this guy was. I gave my statements down at the station later that day once my parents showed up. The police said they had security tapes from the cameras that point down the corridor and will keep us updated with any news. Hopefully, they find this guy. When I was 15, my mother went out shopping and left me in charge of the house. It was starting to get dark and I realized my little brother was nowhere to be found. I asked my sister if she knew where he was and she said he had gone to the park around the corner to kick his soccer ball around. 
I told her to watch the house while I was gone and ran off to the direction of the park. When I got there, I was surprised to find the park completely empty. I called out my brother's name, but there was no answer. I started to get worried, and all of a sudden I heard a faint muffled noise coming from my left. I turned just in time to see a tall figure disappearing behind a large fence. I sprinted as fast as I could when I came around to the other side of the fence. I saw something that almost made me choke in horror. My little brother was being dragged down the alleyway by a tall man. I flew into a rage and tears of anger streamed down my face. I ran at him and he must have heard me coming because he turned around to face me and he dropped my younger brother. The tall man tried to grab me but I was running at him so fast that when I slammed into him it knocked him off his feet. He swore and tried to get back up but I just started stomping on his face. Without stopping to ask questions, I picked my brother up and ran as fast as I could back to our house. By this time it was pitch black outside and my mother was home. She was frantic with worry and when she saw the look on our face she realized that something bad had happened. As I explained, my brother and I started crying and my mom gave us both the biggest hug ever and she cried with us. Eventually the police were called but this guy was never found. A few years ago, more like 10 years ago, I used to be big into visiting weird websites. I had a lot of time on my hand due to not playing sports, nor did I volunteer for anything at all in high school. I told my friend Mark that I was starting to get bored. Honestly, I was bored with what I was experiencing on these websites. He said I should go on the deep web. He and I used to go on the deep web, but never found anything. So I decided to search through some more stuff. A little deeper. I searched for hours every day for about two and a half months. Still nothing that I hadn't seen already. I told Mark and of course he said just visit the dark web. When I did go on the dark web, I saw chat rooms all with different names. I came across one named I as in E-Y-E. It was all in caps. I entered the chat but before entering the live chat, you are assigned a number. Mine was P34. I confirmed my number and entered. There were hundreds of people. The comments were coming in quick. At first, I didn't understand what was going on. The screen was black, then a name popped up on the screen that said Mr. Wiggles. The comments immediately stopped and a voice came over my speakers. Welcome P34. Then his name disappeared off of the screen and the comments continued, everyone giving me welcomes. A few minutes go by, then a countdown from 10 pops up on the screen, then the chat goes crazy. Once it reached the number one, the screen went straight to what looks like a view from a camera just watching someone in what looks like at their home. I sat there watching this for 20 minutes and nothing happened so I shut down my computer. The next day I went to school, had a normal day, went to Walmart, then I went home. I decided to go back on the same chat from before. I confirmed my number P34 and again, there were hundreds of people commenting. Mr. Wiggles popped up and just like before, the comments stopped. Across the screen it said, no new members tonight. Then the countdown started again. Everyone in the chat started going wild. The countdown finished and then it was showing the point of view from a camera again. But it was outside of a school. My school from earlier that day. At that point I was intrigued. I couldn't tell if it was focused on a certain person or just watching the school. After 30 minutes of watching the video, our school bell rang and everyone started to come outside while whoever was recording was positioned across the street in the car. Once everyone came out, the person got out of the car and started to follow a crowd of kids. Everyone started to split from each other and the person recording started to follow someone. It was my friend Mark. 
He had to be at least 100 feet behind him. I started to call Mark, but he didn't answer. I kept calling him as I watched the video, but nothing. The person followed him to his house and sat outside of his house for a few minutes. The man behind the camera finally said, No parents are home. And he began to walk to Mark's house, rang the doorbell, and waited as he continued to record. A few seconds go by, and Mark opened the door. He looked confused, and the guy said, P34 sent me. And Mark looked afraid that the camera shut off and everyone in the chat left. So I did too. I called Mark's house phone instead of his cell phone, and his mother answered. I asked for Mark, and she said that she thought he was with me. I panicked. I then received a notification on my phone from my Gmail account. It said the sender was Mr. Wiggles. The message was, I'm getting closer, P34. Mark says hi. I was shocked and didn't know what to do, so I called the cops. They didn't do anything about it because the email disappeared. I haven't been on the dark web since and no one has seen Mark. Still to this day, I receive messages with pictures of me in random places along with the same written message that said, it can happen anytime. I honestly wish I never went on the dark web.